So, this is a hard drive. This marvel of electromechanic engineering is what people used to run their OS from and store files for decades. It contains spinning platters and read heads which working in unison are able to store and read data at a decent rate with data density getting higher and higher going from mere megabytes in the 80s to terabytes nowadays. And it really wasn't until the late 2000s that other storage formats became competitive and widespread like solid state drives. And even though they had many advantages, hard drives are still in use today because they're kind of hard to beat in terms of price per gigabyte. But lately I feel like people are really starting to turn their backs on them since anytime I show myself using a hard drive for one of my projects, people seem to knock it for various reasons. The main thing people say is that they're slow, unreliable, prone to failure, outdated, noisy, inconvenient, bulky and so on. And I completely agree with most of those things and I wouldn't want to use a hard drive to run my OS from on my everyday workhorse computer, but I still do use them for all sorts of things and I do put operating systems on them uh, when it comes to older systems, which is quite often on my channel. And while I do also use SSDs, for example, when I'm trying to max the system out or run benchmarks and I don't want to be bottlenecked by hard drive speeds, for the vast majority of cases, I just go for HDDs since... I mean, I just have them and they work and for the most part they work very well. I mean, I had very little issues with them. I've actually had very few cases of hard drive failure and perhaps I'm just lucky, but in my experience they've been pretty reliable. That being said, people have moved away from spinning drives even when it comes to older retro systems. Hardware communities have come up with all sorts of adapters which enable you to use all sorts of newer drives and storage media with all sorts of interface converters. And with things like SATA, you have native widespread support for both hard drives and SSDs without the need for a converter. But for earlier computers, you likely have to use something like this IDE to SATA adapter, which I've used plenty of times. But one thing that's been super popular among retro enthusiasts are SD cards, which you can use with a simple device like this and use it with an IDE interface. And given how compact this is, it looks like it would be a great fit for a laptop. Although you can get these things with various brackets, like for mounting it in a 3.5 inch drive bay or in the back, in like the I.O. slot. That way it's also super accessible if you like swapping files or operating systems on the fly, or especially for older computers without USB support, unlike a 386 or a 486. It's very convenient if you'd like to just add files to it. And I for one have never tried using these because like I've said I would just use what I have and I've never had any particular issues with IDE hard drives. But it was high time to get familiar with these and I was very curious to see for myself not just how these perform but also how they compare to regular IDE drives. So I got myself this IDE to SD card adapter from AliExpress and this particular one was very cheap, like 10 bucks, and it looked to be very simple and idiot proof, which is good given how, you know. <laughs> Anyways, I also had a perfect test subject for this experiment. I recently got this titanium power book from an auction for a very good price. And after testing it, I could see that it was working fine. However, it didn't seem to have anything to boot from. So initially, just to test it out, I popped in an OS9 boot disk and yeah, it booted right up, which made me very happy because that meant it had a working optical drive, which was good. <laughs> But I could see it didn't detect any hard drives, so I've decided to boot from an OS X install disk and I went with Tiger and upon checking the disk utility, yeah, it only recognized the optical drive. So that meant it either had a missing or a dead hard drive. And so I've decided to experiment with this SD card interface, but before giving that a shot, I wanted to set a baseline and do what I normally do in this situation, which is just to install a regular laptop ID hard drive, because I have a lot of spare drives and I see no reason not to use them. This particular drive is a known good one. I pulled it out of one of my ThinkPads. It's an old clicky travel star and these old drives are kind of hit or miss but like I've said this one works so we'll see how well it compares. And changing out the hard drive and anything else for that matter is very easy on these titanium power books and even though it's not as convenient as having a drawer or a compartment it just involves removing a couple of Torx screws and taking off that bottom cover and at this point you pretty much have access to the entire computer. 
and we can see that that two and a half inch drive bay is empty which is not a huge surprise but from my experience people rarely take out their drives from computers when getting rid of them so this was definitely an exception and I was also very happy that whoever took out the drive left a little hard drive cable which is essential so I'll just take it off and attach it to our IDE connector at the back and this thing still had the little caddy from the notebook I stole it from, so it was a nice tight fit, even though the original bracket from the power book was missing. So yeah, that's that. I've popped the back cover back on and I've booted the machine up, stuck that OS X Tiger install disk in there and proceeded to format the new drive using the disk utility. It recognized it without any issues, so I made our new partition and started installing the OS. I was happy to see this thing installing fine, although it did take a while, and I've timed it, just so that I have a baseline to compare it to the SD card, and it took right under 40 minutes. After it was all done, I've entered all the necessary info, and I was happy to be greeted by that OS X Tiger desktop. Awesome! At this point I wanted to again have some hard data I could then compare to our SD card interface so I've hooked up my old external hard drive and I have various test files I use with these old Macs I do videos on. And I wanted to see how long would all these image files take to transfer and I was completely shocked to see that all that data was moving in 2 megabyte chunks. Like what? And I have completely forgotten that this poor power book only has USB 1.1 revision, which absolutely sucks ass. And since I didn't feel like messing with Firewire, I just let it cook while I went out to run some errands. Man, USB 1. I guess it's better than no USB. So there are a couple of things I wanted to test out, first being the general OS performance, which, you know, is what you'd expect from this class of machine, and as far as G4 systems and powerbooks go, this really isn't a very capable unit, and it's the slowest G4 I have. It has a 500MHz processor with 512MB of RAM and only 16MB of VRAM. Yikes. So many of the games I like to run on these guys simply don't want to even start up, like Call of Duty 2 and Doom 3. And the reason I like running these is because they have a built-in FPS counter, which is helpful if you're doing benchmarks. There are plenty of other games I could try, but many of them run under OS 9, like Unreal or Quake. And while I could try running them in Classic, I like sticking to native ports. And it turns out there aren't a ton of ports that work both on Mac OS X and PowerPC and have a built-in FPS counter and also have low enough specifications to run on this low-end older model of PowerBook. Oh well, something that barely runs is UT2004, and I mean it runs like utter garbage, and I do realize that's mostly due to this thing running very low on video RAM, but I still wondered if there'd be an appreciable difference with a faster drive. As it is, we get single digit frame rates, like I've said, the game is pretty much unplayable. And since I couldn't get the demo for Call of Duty 2 going, I've settled for Call of Duty 1, which thankfully ran, even though the bare minimum recommended requirements call for an 800 plus megahertz G4. As it is, again, it ran like crap, but I wanted to compare things like loading times, which I felt could be improved with a faster hard drive, and yeah, we'll see how that goes. So in lieu of any other supported games, I have turned to the golden age of Blizzard when they were absolutely on the top of the world and making killer games. Games like Starcraft, Diablo and Warcraft. Starcraft and Diablo 2 here work wonderfully on low spec G4 systems. The only issue is there's no frame counter and there's no easy way of enabling it in macOS. But we'll compare the loading times on video later on. And I had this early big box release of Warcraft, which not only contained freaking 5 CDs, but was also compatible with OS X and PowerPC. And even though I knew my processor wasn't fast enough to meet the requirements and also lacked VRAM, I still wanted to give it a shot. And upon loading up that first CD, the thing warned me about having a piss poor CPU, however it would still let me install. So I was curious to see what would happen, so I proceeded with the installation and not 5 minutes later I was already regretting it. Man, I've totally forgotten how long these things used to take with early CD and DVD drives. I mean, I'm talking like a full hour of feeding the discs in and watching that dreaded progress bar, fearing that one of the discs will have issues reading and I'd have to do it all over again. And it's only like 5 gigs of data, I mean, Jesus. 
But thankfully, after all that, I did install successfully, and I was greeted by a disappointingly choppy FMV animation, and I mean, no wonder. And even though I was able to get my PowerBook here to connect to a local Wi-Fi network, I just couldn't get it to connect to a server. So that's a bunch of waste of time. <laughs> However, again, we'll see if the frame rate of that intro cinematic is improved in any way. I also wanted to see how long it would take to copy a 700 megabyte ISO file from one location to the other one, and it took just over 2 minutes to do that, and we'll again be comparing that to the alternative SD card. Now measuring how long things take to load and copy is cool and all as it gives you some real life data, and is of course what's going to matter the most in day to day use. But I also wanted to have something more scientific, so I used an old PPC benchmarking software called QuickBench to see what it thinks of my ID hard drive. And I let it draw me a nice little graph containing some numbers for sequential and random reads and writes, and we can see that this thing averages between 7 and 11 megabytes per second overall, which looking up the data sheet for my particular drive wasn't really close to the maximum data transfer rate. There's also the IDE interface we need to take into the account. Uh, more specifically, this PowerBook uses the Ultra ATA 66, which, fittingly, supports speeds up to 66 megabytes per second. So with the correct drive, ideally that's the speed we should be hitting, at least as far as burst speeds are concerned. So, what about these old hard drives? Well, it's all pretty much par for the course. They're kinda slow, but they work, and like I've said, I never really had any real problems using them for my older projects. And with these old guys, you always have other bottlenecks to worry about, like CPU speeds, GPU performance, and optical drive speeds. But at this point I was very curious to try out that SD card adapter and see just what kind of a speed boost could we get, if any. And this thing looks super simple, the only thing to configure really are a couple of extra jumpers for master or slave, but if you're installing this in a laptop, chances are you won't have to touch these at all. And I chose to use this 128GB card I had lying around, and according to its datasheet, it provides up to 100MB read and write speeds, although continuous write speeds are advertised as more than 30MB per second. Either way, it's supposed to be a lot faster than that hard drive. That being the case, I just plugged it in, and since I didn't have that cage or a 3D printed mounting bracket, it just kind of flapped around. But given how it's solid state, I mean, I wasn't too worried about it, it's not like I was going to throw this thing around. After putting the lid back on and popping in that boot CD, I was curious to see if the disk utility would recognize this as a legitimate drive, and sure it did. So I made sure to format it, and off it went with the OS installation. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting it to be drastically faster, since I think the optical drive is going to be the speed bottleneck in this case, and yeah, the whole process took around 40 minutes, same as the traditional hard drive. The main difference really was the lack of clicks and background noise you get with mechanical drives, and yes, I'm familiar with those clickers you can install alongside these to simulate hard drive noises, but I always found those to be kinda ridiculous. After the installation had finished, I just took some time to get my test files ready and to load everything up on here, and I was curious to see if I'd be able to notice any difference just doing general OS tasks, and I have to say I do think it felt snappier, but I wanted to have some hard data to compare to our previous hard drive. So I proceeded to copy the exact same file to a different location, and yep, I could see that it was taking way less. In fact, it was around double the speed. It took less than a minute to do the same 700 meg file. As for game performance, well, while the SD card didn't really help with things like in-game rendering, and again, this machine has other bottlenecks, in particular the slow CPU and lack of VRAM, but we did see some improvements with loading times. Take a look at Call of Duty 1 here for example, and I'll have the two side by side, and you'll be able to tell just how much faster we get in game with that SD card. And yeah, there was like 40% improvement, which was awesome. And at this point I was ready to run that drive benchmark utility, and if there was any doubt as to the superiority of that SD card, yeah, it couldn't be any more black and white here. And even though we got nowhere close to rated maximum of either the card or the Ultra ATA interface, we did however see more than double the speeds with both reads and writes, and unlike that hard drive which had all sorts of dips and spikes, uh, and I guess that's due to seek time of the read heads, 
These graphs look very consistent and uniform. So what's my opinion on these SD280 adapters? Well, given how cheap and versatile they are, I mean, they're pretty awesome. Not to mention that they can provide you with quite a bit of a speed boost, especially if you're upgrading from a slower hard drive. But one major benefit I didn't even realize was a thing until this point is the price difference. And that's because I just wanted to see what these old IDE notebook drives are going for on eBay. And this crap is just ridiculous. Who's buying this old crap at these prices? I mean, are people insane? <laughs> I know the supply isn't what it used to be 15 years ago, but still, it's just stupid. And it proves once again that if you slap retro on an item, it immediately jumps like 2000% in value. Anyway, if you don't happen to have a pile of these IDE drives already like I do, and you don't have anywhere you can source them from locally, for the love of everything that's holy, don't buy these guys on eBay. Especially since you have a great alternative nowadays and lower capacity SD cards can be had for pennies. And if you're dealing with an older computer, I mean my travel star is only 20 gigs in capacity, so even a 32 gig SD card ought to be enough. Just make sure to get one that has decent read and write speeds. And like I've mentioned already, it's really great if you want to, for example, swap configurations on the fly, so you could have, for example, one OS9 card, one with Tiger on it, and so on. Also, if you have a computer with a slow USB interface or even a broken optical drive, it enables you to load up the files to that SD card externally, which is much easier to do than with an IDE hard drive. So yeah, if you have older notebooks with a dead or a missing hard drive, or you'd just like to breathe new life into it, I'd say these adapters are a great way of doing that, and I'll definitely order some more, just to have on hand for future projects. And if you like watching old hardware getting upgrades and generally being appreciated, you might want to check out some of my other videos, and also subscribing. I do videos like this every week, and you can also help me out a little by signing up for my Patreon. You'll get early access to my videos, and I already have a couple of interesting ones up there. And if you'd like to chat with me and other users, you can join our Discord server. All the links will be in the video description. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers.